Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Fisher. I am a principal here at the Raven Group. When I say here, just like everybody else working from my home office. This is my colleague on the screen, Patty First. She is a um, founding principal at the firm and she is runs the issues campaign of issues, issue campaigns and movements practice here at the Raven Group. Hi, everybody. So thank you all for joining us. We have a really great uh, presentation today. I think um, what's there's a lot you're going to hear today that you may know already. What we're hoping is is that everybody's able to pull various pieces. This is a this is a difficult time for the progressive movement. Um, you know, there's right now we're gonna we're gonna talk through everything um, that we think that you know that we've learned over the past month or so um, about how to be um, how you can be effective in advocacy during this period of both. A pandemic and an economic shutdown, um, and people not going to events. And all of us in this movement um, have events. Uh, I think the, what we want to hope to convey to you is don't cancel anything. There's tons of opportunities out there. So we hope you're able to learn some, to learn learn a, a good bit today. We're going to talk about the news cycle, uh, which everybody is is aware of. What 24/7 coronavirus. Uh, we're going to talk about um, how to create compelling e advocacy how to keep your members close and involved. When we say members, your supporters, your base, all those people, donors, how to keep them close to you, how to, how to make sure that, that you don't lose them over the next few months um, when it's, again, 24-7 coronavirus. And then how to use some of your stars. When we say that, we mean your um, EDs, your CEOs, some of your senior staff, your, your superstars, how to use them, and even some external um, your artist ambassadors, how to use them as well. Then, I'll, then something a little bit about some of the little things that we've learned and um, want to impart to you guys. So let's, um, Patty. Unless there's anything else, I'll I'll get started on the um, talking about the news cycle. Take it away, Stephen. Thank you, Patty. Um, so it's as we as people know, this is everything is twenty four seven coronavirus. Um, that's a challenge but it's also a little bit of an opportunity in a way, in the sense that something that's touching all of our lives, coronavirus means it's touching all of our issues. So at the Raven Group, we have been um, helping clients with a lot of issues and helping them get actually get stories placed. Um, for example, um, you know the, the role of gun, domestic violence amid the coronavirus lockdown. Uh, there's a huge um, increase in um, domestic violence and there's, expectation that, that will even increase even more. Um, so we've been able to play stories, getting that message out. Um, and again, we strongly believe that, you know, every one of your issues probably touches coronavirus in some way or another. Um, some more examples, you know, you know again, beyond domestic violence. Um, uh, th actually, this was now this, for example, we did this for YWCA. Childcare, um, a very big issue. Uh, for essential workers, um, uh, the criminal justice system, the our nation's prisons and jails, people who are incarcerated are, for lack of a better word, they're sitting ducks for the coronavirus. And so we've been helping um, a lot of clients really connect that. And I'm sure you've probably seen a lot of stories about that with a lot of governors letting um, de-incarcerating, decarcerating people um, where possible. Um, the census, and certainly, as we come up to the election this year. Um, so there's an enormous amount you can do. Um, and then, you know, there's still room. I mean, it's 95 cent for coronavirus, but look at this op-ed that got placed last week in the New York Times about um, LGBT polit political, um, uh, LGBT politics in the 2020 election. So there's uh, really, there's still room for other issues. Um, but really, be you want to be really creative about connecting your issues to coronavirus, talking to reporters about it, and you know there's definitely op-eds, letters to the editor, and other other tactics that we'll talk about in a bit as well. So um, let's move on to my colleague Danny Herrera, uh, also in the communications practice, and he'll take it away on compelling e-advocacy. Thanks so much, Stephen. Uh, calling in from Los Angeles, California. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, I want to talk about some guiding principles for compelling e-advocacy. Um, first up, engagement is key. Uh, really think about how best you are going to engage your audience 
Um, remember that in some ways it is harder to do uh, compelling e-advocacy because you need to keep the full uh, attention of your audience. And sometimes that's harder to do online. That's why oftentimes, um, you know, certain aspects of social media um, are shorter, pithier, um, more simple, more visually uh, uh, lean, leaning on visuals. Um, so just think about that. Um, uh, a second guiding principle um, that, that I truly recommend is thinking that, about how virtual events can replace um, some things, but not everything. So for example, you can repurpose a uh, conference that you might've had where you had a keynote address um, and do that online and do that maybe on Facebook or on Instagram, um, but that doesn't necessarily apply to every aspect of an in-person conference. Um, for, uh, for example, things that you do at conferences like fundraising or networking, those are, are not gonna be easily uh, you know, repurposed in a video format, but there might be some other aspects that you might be able to do. Um, can you or should you? Um, just because you can doesn't mean you should do um, uh, uh, an online event or a video chat or um, some of the things that my colleagues will talk later on. Put yourself in the position of your audience. Uh, are they going to want to participate in this particular event at this time? Um, is it compelling? Is it relevant right now? Or is it something that can wait? And then on the flip side of that, um, don't assume that you can't pull off uh, advocacy. Not everything has to be fully polished. It doesn't have to be perfect. Embrace a little bit of that authenticity. Um, all of us um, here at Raven and you know, all of us who are trying to do advocacy on, on progressive issues, we're all learning a lot of these things at the same time. Um, so kind of embrace that authenticity. It's not the end of the world. If your kid barges in on a video conference call, you know, it, it'll happen to the best of us. It's, you know, breathe and it'll be fine. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about um, meeting people where they are. Uh, my colleagues will talk specifically about um, platforms and matching those with your audiences. But I want to talk a little bit about the broader aspects and talking about basics. Uh, really, you want to treat your e-event or virtual event um, the same way that you would treat your uh, you know, in-person event. So if you're thinking about repurposing a previously scheduled event, what were your original goals? Can you still achieve uh, those same goals or something similar or maybe a more narrow version of that goal? Um, and then who are your audiences and can you still reach those audiences? Are they national, state, or lo local legislators? Um, can you reach them through these platforms? Um, if you can't reach them, can you reach grassroots advocates who can call or email or tweet um, those, those legislators. Um, and finally, what do you want your audiences to do? Um, do you wanna motivate them to contact lawmakers on a particular topic? For say, for example, uh, student loan forgiveness. Um, are you giving these people the tools they need to carry out those actions? Um, once you have the answers to those questions, then you can really, those will help you navigate and pick what platform is best uh, for those purposes. And I, like I said, my colleagues will talk a little bit more specifically, but I do want um, you know, folks on, on, on this video link to think about what does success look like? Um, has someone done something similar that, that, that you liked? What did you like? What did you not like? What can you mimic? And what would you like to change? Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, pass this on along to my colleague, uh, Charlie in Nashville. Thank you so much, Danny. I appreciate that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how do you put people in the room? Um, so when we're doing live events, we always have a, an atmosphere that we're trying to fill, whether that's the office, whether that's the conference room, whether that's an entire auditorium for gala and reception. Um, we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can put yourself back into that digital room by using face-to-face -face meetings, by doing presentations, and um, some of the platforms that empower you to do so. Um, you wanna think about all your events and what you already had planned and how you can uh, replicate them, sort of as Danny mentioned. So if you have a keynote speaker that's gonna be at your event, your keynote speaker is gonna remain a great draw for a digital event. So be sure to re repurpose the talent that you've already secured. Um, go face to face. Be sure to like have those in-person meetings. If you're meeting with a lawmaker, you're meeting with staff, you're meeting with a uh, critical member of your, of your coalition across the country that you're gonna fly out to see, 
set up a Google Hangout, set up a Zoom call, set out a, set up a chat so that you can uh, so you can still have that intimate experience. Um, produce the event and have the meeting. Um, there's going to be a lot that goes into creating digital events, just like goes into regular events. Um, have an event producer that can help you out. Have a digital producer that can help you out. Um, create the graphics that you needed. Create the links that you needed. Um, and use the platform that works best for you. Um, there are lots of different options out there right now for creating presentations. Uh, we happen to be using StreamYard. Um, some of the similar competitive options are Crowdcast, and Cvent has some, and Facebook has a new video platform. The one that works best for you is the one that's going to work best. Um, there is no right or wrong answer. It's what you're comfortable with um, and what you are most, most familiar with. So I want to dive into what we've become really comfortable with, which is StreamYard. Um, StreamYard is a really neat platform to create sort of panel discussions similar to what we host here at Raven Group in our policy breakfast and policy lunches and power lunches, where you can have a panel of experts speaking to a large audience. Um, StreamYard allows you to reach standing audiences on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook by doing a simultaneous broadcast. Um, so right now, obviously, we're broadcasting to YouTube through, uh, through a link. Um, you can also have a live stream to your Facebook page, to your LinkedIn page, and these can all happen simultaneously. My colleague Lauren will jump in in a little bit to describe how to choose those audiences and which ones work best. Um, but StreamYard allows you to have up to six people on the screen at once. It allows you to put people from across the country, as you've noticed here, um, into one large presentation. It gives you some of these neat features like having these lower thirds below me, having this uh, Chiron above me, having, a, having the PowerPoint broadcast with us. Um, and have people jump around, drop in these uh, banners below us as our producer Elizabeth is uh, demonstrating. And my favorite part, which we'll see later, is how you can have an integrated Q&A where even the audience can get involved by asking comments in the comment feature. Um, so we encourage you guys to check this out as a solution for producing some of your live events. Um, and I'm going to pass it off to my colleague Lauren, who can actually talk a little bit about why you'd want to use some platforms over the other as far as reaching your audiences and what those benefits can be. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I am talking to you from the Washington, D.C. area, specifically Maryland. Um, and so um, I am happy to be here and I'm glad you're here to, to join us. Um, so the key thing to remember um, is to choose the best platform that will uh, make it easier for you to reach the, your intended audience. So, for instance, if you are trying to reach a younger audience, then um, Instagram Live might be better for you, or Instagram in general might be might be a better fit for what you're trying to do. Um, however, if you want to reach someone who is maybe um, who's not a millennial, who's maybe um, an, an older generation or a more seasoned generation, excuse me, um, then Facebook might work a little bit better um, simply because that's where they are. So it's about being where they are as well. Um, now the other thing is that uh, it depends. Also, another factor is how many speakers you're tr you're trying to feature at once. Um, so on Instagram Live, you can have up to two people on the screen at a time. Um, you can actually see that in in the in the screenshot here, where um, uh, Steph Curry is talking to was talking to Dr. Fauci on Instagram Live, and I'll say more about that a little bit later. Um, um, but if you if you are having only one if you have only a one screen uh, setup, then Facebook Live could work a little bit better for you. Um, the last thing you want to consider it is the kind of event you're planning, and so let's talk about what those are. Uh, for Facebook Live. Um, it's great for a live Q&A. Um, it's great for discussions about certain topics or giving an update or a public or a single public statement um, about a campaign or an issue or whatever you may want to talk about that day. Um, it's a great choice if you will only have one speaker talking at a time. Um, and, it, you know, they, the, and also for those who, who don't know, the Facebook Live is a live stream um, uh, capability within Facebook. So you could only, it can only broadcast to people who have a Facebook account. And so, but at the same time, anybody on Facebook can, can view your, your live. Um, so the, it, it has a potential for very large audiences, like meaning more than, you know, hundred or 50 or even 25 people. You can have, lot, there's a potential for a lot of, for a large reach, for a wide reach. Um, for IG Live, uh, one thing that you may want to try out is, for instance, let's say you were going to have some kind of gala or another event that was featuring a musician, for instance. Um, you can have that musician perform live on Instagram Live. Um, 
And, you know, lots of music artists have done this. I want to say that John Legend was the first uh, artist to, to, to use Instagram Live to do a, a concert in his home uh, during the, the coronavirus outbreak. Um, but lots of music artists and DJs have done this, uh, who have done this successfully. So if that's the kind of event you're trying to do. Um, Instagram Live is a great option for that. Um, Instagram Live also uh, allows for um, uh, streaming uh, two-way conversation. So two, having two people on a screen at a time. Um, it's a good platform for for one-on-one conversations with two featuring two people um, about issues that are relevant to your mission. Um, you know, I give the, the example of Steph Curry talking to Dr. Fauci, but there's lots of limitless possibilities there. Um, it also has, I believe, it has a Q and A feature on Instagram Live um, that you can also use if you are answering questions about a certain thing, if you want to hear from people. Um, so that's another uh, another option for you. And I, and I want to stress here that uh, the possibilities and the options are limitless, but it takes some some creative thinking and it takes really honing in on who your audience is. Um, so lastly, uh, with you can use Zoom or Google Hangout um, for a smaller audience. I believe Google Hangout allows for you to have up to 150 people at a time attending and, 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 and interacting. Um, and these are all great, like these two, uh, Zoom and, and Google Hangout, are very good uh, for um, events like Hill briefings, um, events like uh, virtual town hall meetings, um, you know, things that are normally held in person, but couldn't, cannot be. Um, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, and they've used Zoom, for instance, uh, to talk, to give updates on the coronavirus, to answer questions, do a, a virtual town hall about what's being done uh, to support essential workers and other things. So, um, you know, um, there, those are, that's another opportunity there. Um, you could also use it, I, I believe, for, for press conferences. So if you have, you know, if there's something that, that, that is pressing that you want to talk to the press about, you can always set up a Zoom room or a Google Hangout to talk to them and have them ask, ask questions. Um, that's, another, that's another opportunity as well. Um, so, yeah, that's the, that's, uh, that's, that's, um, those are the, some of the options that you have. Um, and I am going to hand it over um, to my, uh, my colleague, uh, Charlie. Hello, hello. Thank you, Lauren, for that great overview. Um, I just want to add in a little bit on the Zoom and Google Hangouts. It's another great option for having those face-to-face -face meetings. Um, if it's just you and one other person, this is a uh, good, both, both simple, easy-to-use platforms to get those face-to-face -face conversations, um, just like on FaceTime and all these other options. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how you leverage all of the extra time and we'll be joined by the, some of our team here as well. Um, but right now, obviously, everyone's grounded. Everyone's at home, um, no longer chasing down cabs and running to flights. Um, and so there's a lot more time to be leveraged from your principals and from your executives um, that may not always have that hour long block, that tour long block to do sort of long form writing or to do some uh, some question and answers with the membership. Um, so one of the one of the examples that we want to point out is a Reddit Ask Me Anything, um, commonly referred to as an AMA. Um, AMAs are used by people that do interesting jobs, frontline workers, people that run companies, Bill Gates, um, people that run dating apps um, like Bumble, um, the President of the United States, uh, former President Obama. Um, is what AMAs allow you to do is to have a really intimate conversation with an active and engaged online audience. Um, folks can ask questions on this forum and, and you can actually respond in real time to these questions. It gives, uh, gives folks the opportunity to connect intimately with folks, um, to give long form answers, to uh, do some writing and to talk to a community that um, sometimes you can't find in other places. Um, Reddit's a great place to explore different communities that have very specific interests and to plug into those communities and leverage them as part of your base. Um, so as Lauren was talking earlier about finding your audience where they are, Reddit can be a great place to find one of your audiences that have those very niche interests. So whether you're in a nurse's thread, whether you're in a doctor's thread, whether you're in a nonprofit's thread, um, you can host one of these AMAs or Ask Me Anything to have a really uh, deep dive conversation over the course of um, an hour or two um, to answer some of those questions. Uh, the other option that you can have for some of these long form writing is through Medium. Uh, my colleague Steven is going to join here as well to talk a little bit about 
what you can do with Medium. But for those that don't know, it's just sort of an online blog, um, a self-publishing option that we actually use here at the Raven Group for our practice area, Impact Entertainment. This is where we welcome our new colleagues. This is where we share some of our thought pieces um, about what the world going on around us. However, it's not without, uh, not without a little bit of work that goes into it. Um, so I'm gonna have Steven sort of talk about making that magic happen. Yeah, you know, when we talked, thanks, Charlie. You know, when we talked earlier about op-eds and sort of the difficulty getting op-eds placed, Medium is a great alternative because it's self-publishing. And we advise all our clients, you know, it's getting press for press, for press's sake, isn't um, always what you want. You know, the, the most important thing is, you know, if you get an op-ed placed, is to make sure that your supporters and donors and members see it, see the op-ed. So as soon as you get the op-ed placed, we help clients, for example, you know, uh, send an e you know, create an email from the COO or somebody, here's the, you know, here's, our, here's our president's new op-ed in the New York Times, that kind of thing. So Medium provides you with the same, um, it doesn't necessarily have the same cachet because it's self-publishing, but it does give you that opportunity to push it out to your supporters, get your message out in a crowded, you know, paid media, I'm sorry, earned media environment. This is an easy way to write an op-ed, place it yourself, and then get it out to your members on social media and um, in direct and just directly through email. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Patty and I will talk a little bit about that later. Thanks, Stephen. Um, to actually talk a little bit more about some of these online options, we're going to bring in our colleague Clark in Washington, D.C., um, who will give us some of the background on both Twitter and email campaigns. Clark, I think we're having trouble hearing you. Clark, can you hear me? No, I don't think so. Um, I don't know if folks uh, if folks can hear um, Clark right now, but I don't believe I can. All right, we're going to try to resolve some of those issues with Clark's uh, audio right now. Sorry for that, but uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the things that Clark was going to talk about. Um, this is really about uh, grassroots advocacy. I mentioned this earlier uh, during the presentation, but really um, a lot of organizations around this time in the spring and the summer uh, do um, hill briefings and hill advocacy. Um, they fly in members from across the country to, to advocate on behalf of, uh, of important policy issues uh, on, on either in Congress or, uh, or in state legislatures. And so obviously with some of the limitations on travel and, um, and, and, and physical contact with coronavirus, um, those things have to be pared back down. But what we can do in terms of replacements to those, in addition to phone meetings, in addition to video conference calls, um, is um, act activating your base, activating your members and your constituents and your supporters to advocate for those issues uh, online. And two of those options obviously are Twitter, um, and then also email, um, email advocacy, um, email communications with those offices. Um, so some of the uh, campaigns that my colleague Clark has worked on um, it, uh, um, are campaigns for the Fulton County Jail uh, to release at-risk at folks who are inc incarcerated there. Um, so, you know, this kind of, ad uh, this kind of activism um, is through Twitter, through hashtags, and through activating members um, to, to put out messages and, and bring awareness about the issue. Um, uh, another campaign that uh, my colleague Clark worked on, um, this one might have been, I'm trying to remember how many years back, this, this might have been a couple of years back. Uh, this was uh, uh, on issues of equity and resources for, for Puerto Rico um, around the time of, um, right after the hurricane. Um, so we, uh, embarked on a number of email campaigns to get uh, followers who had subscribed to the email list um, to advocate and to push their lawmakers um, to give more resources and more equity uh, for uh, people living in Puerto Rico who were not only suffering from the uh, financial crisis um, that, that was caused by uh, debt issues in Puerto Rico, but obviously by um, hurricanes, um, the delay in, in 
disaster relief, and then most recently um, earthquakes that hit uh, the, the island. Um, so you know, things to keep in mind when you're doing successful email campaigns, uh, make sure that you're focusing on visuals, on creative content, um, and then also make sure that you're having simple asks. So whether you're doing this on Twitter or on email, um, you really wanna try to limit it to one thing that you are asking your supporters to do. So is that calling their member of Congress? Is that um, sharing this information to bring awareness to, to five or more friends? Um, keep that, keep those asks simple and then keep them to a minimum because if you, once you add more asks, um, you're really, what you're doing is you're increasing the likelihood that someone will not take an action. Um, and so uh, that's a little bit about um, uh, some of the work that my, some of the work that my colleague Clark um, has been working on. I'm gonna pass this over to my colleague, Patty, um, to talk a little bit uh, about member engagement. Before we add- Hi, Patty. Before, I think before we get to Patty, we have uh, just a little bit of ideas on the planning of all these digital events. Um, and then we'll, uh, then we'll talk a little bit about that member engagement. Um, so for the, for the plate of events, it's just like you would for any live event, you wanna make sure that you are doing the steps to fill the room, to have people turn out and to have people engage. Um, that looks, that can look like, uh, using ads on Facebook. So any of the, any of the promotion that we're gonna use for in-person events, the printing costs, the, uh, banner ads, the bus ads. We can repurpose those dollars to make ads online, to get people to attend an online event. There's obviously a lot more competition nowadays. I mean, it's gonna be uh, gonna be competitive to get your voice heard in the digital marketplace. Um, so don't underestimate the power of those dollars. Um, create a registration form and an invitation that sends out. I believe everyone, I believe everyone that's on this got the invitation through either the Raven email list, um, through some of our posts on social media, um, and then you RSVP'd and you received a link. Um, similar to how someone would RSVP to a save the date and then you'd share the address to the event later on. You want to do the same thing for your digital events so you can continue to build your email list so it can all play into each other. Um, you want to make sure that you have people show up for your dress rehearsals. Um, you want to make sure that people know where to be standing at what points so they can be on, uh, they can be on the screens um, and they can be comfortable with the technology that they're using. Um, online events, they are events the exact same way that an in-person event. Some of the logistics behind it are a little bit different, um, but the amount of I's and T's to dot and cross are going to be the exact same. Um, and here at Raven, we are coming quickly well-versed in it um, and obviously are happy to help our clients make, make some of these digital events happen and share expertise um, with all of you to ensure uh, successful events. So on engaging those members, uh, now we're gonna go back to Patty to talk about how to engage your members and keep everyone close. Patty? Hi, everyone. And thank you, Charlie. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy right now. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how to keep your members close, how to engage your members. Um, staying close means just that, staying close to your membership, staying close to what they care about. We've talked a lot today about audience and, um, and uh, knowing who your audience is and where they are. Um, when you want to engage your membership right now during this um, time of a pandemic, you know, go to where your audience is. Don't, uh, don't just put something out there and assume that they're going to look at it. Really think about what is it that they care about right now, right? So one thing that people really care about right now is connection. How are we connecting? So all of the digital platforms that we've talked about are one way to connect. But in addition to that, on a deeper, more values-based level, everyone is feeling very connected to each other right now. So more than ever, for example, we need to trust that others are doing what's good for all of us, right? Wearing a mask, social distancing, et cetera. Um, I saw a recent report from the group More in Common that um, has new data that they've uh, put together based on a survey that they've done um, during the pandemic on how uh, Americans are feeling about unity. And right now, what they found is that 90% of Americans believe that we're all in this together compared to 63% in the fall of 2018. And that 82% of people in this country say that we have more in common than what divides us. Um, which is amazing. And, um, and if you can connect 
on that values basis with your supporters and your members, they're more likely to respond to you. They're more likely to take action when you want them to take action. Um, the other thing to keep in mind though about what people care about is that everyone right now is um, leading with their vulnerabilities because they're scared legitimately. Um, make sure that you're not leading with your vulnerabilities. So before you send an email, before you publish something, um, when you're doing a Facebook Live, just make sure that you're not in a scarcity mindset because other people will really sense that. Meet your audience where they are and acknowledge that it's a scary time and do things that foster that connection, that feeling of connection. So um, the second big thing is to be sensitive, but don't stop doing your advocacy, right? Um, people actually are looking to um, be advocates right now. They are looking to be helpful. They're looking to speak out. So you don't have to pause your advocacy, but do be sensitive to how you're reaching out to your supporters and to your members and to what you're asking them to do. So um, how to do that? How do you convey your issues? Well, one is to communicate with empathy and compassion, right? You don't, you don't know what your members or supporters are going through. Um, just, you know, be empathetic and compassionate in your communications and find a segue that using that empathy and compassion connects your work to where your members are or supporters are right now. So for example, there's a recent New York Times piece, uh, New York Times op-ed on the number of healthcare workers who have DACA. Um, status, which is 29,000 of them, and why the Supreme Court should ensure that people who have DACA do not lose their status. So there's a Supreme Court case right now that we're waiting for an opinion on um, that would decide the fate of those in this country who have DACA. Um, and this op-ed was saying, look, in this time of a pandemic, it is even more important that we have all of the healthcare workers that we can and 29,000 of them have DACA. So this piece educated people both on the Supreme Court case so that they could get more involved in that advocacy. And it also reinforced the positive narr narrative about how people who have DACA give back to this country, right? So the next thing I'd say is host, virtual, host regular virtual events. Um, I think, you know, as we've all said, don't worry about whether everything is perfect. Pick the platform that feels good to you. People want information now and um, they, they want that information quickly, right? So get them the information, get it to them quickly. Don't worry about whether or not it's perfect. There will be mistakes. People's audio won't work, you know, like stuff will happen and and your members and supporters will understand that and they will just be happy that you're hosting um, virtual events and that you're um, moving forward in this virtual new world. Um, and then the last thing that I'd say is to get creative, right? Now's the time to innovate and see what works. We're all learning new methods of advocacy in real time right now. Um, if you need to move your organizing to digital, innovate and see what works to reach and engage your audience. You have nothing to lose right now by innovating and you have a lot to gain. So with that, Stephen, I'm gonna pass it back over to you to talk to us about uh, setting a new tone. Thanks, Patty. And yeah, following up on everything Patty just said, I think you know we do a lot of, of writing um, for um, principals. You know, when I say principals, I mean CEOs, um, executive directors, presidents of nonprofits and corporate entities and the the tone as patty was saying it's the tone is really important now we have to really be mindful of where people where people are it's a, it's a sensitive time so i think the most important thing is to be more personal than usual talk about you know if you're sending an email to your supporters and as patty said you should be you need to be in contact with them but drop the ed speak you know avoid the jargon talk just try to be as plain spoken as possible and just talk about um, you know, you might want to make some personal references, talk about the staff, how they're doing, um, you know, really, really get more intimate than, than you normally would on a, on a fundraising email or a take a, a call to action email, something like that. So it's really important to just try to be as much more personal, uh, than you usually would be. Um, I, I think it's important to minimize branding. I think marketing people are not, people don't respond well to marketing now. Um, so 
you know, it's okay to send an email from your from your executive director without perhaps without a logo, uh, perhaps without you know call, you know borders around the on the sides. Make it a little bit more feel direct, feel like they're sending an email directly to to um, to the audience. And be pithy. Try not to write long emails. Uh, you know, keep keep it short. Let people know what's going on. Let people know what's important, what you're working on, um, and then and then um, end it. Um, again, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to write these long pieces. And if you want to link to some, you know, if you do have a medium piece or an op-ed that got placed, link to that. Talk about that. Make sure that people see that. So related to that, you know, we all have stars in our in all our organizations. Sometimes there are legal director or, um, you know, internally or somebody who's out in the front lines, really, you know, doing the work, doing the hard work on the front lines. And sometimes it's our external um, people, um, you know, sometimes artist ambassadors. We do a lot of work with artists. Um, the Raven Group does a lot of work with artists, um, particularly in the um, gun safety movement. So this is, first of all, it's a new opportunity for spokespeople. So again, think through those people on the front lines. This is the kind of thing you know, as we talk through all these different platforms and all these different ways to communicate, do a panel with um, people who normally might not have a, um, a uh, who might, you might not normally feature. Again, people out on the front lines, if you're a, a service organization, uh, if you have a legal director who can really talk about, you know, the uh, coronavirus response bills, those are perfect kinds of things to do. People are really craving information. So you should, um, you should get it out there. Um, and as I said, use artist ambassadors, but use them really carefully. Um, you know, if, if, if to, for an example, um, just Google Gal Gadot um, and imagine it's a, uh, and you'll see exactly what I mean. It's a video that she did very well intentioned and we all love Gal Gadot, but it was, she and a bunch of celebrities sang the song Imagine and it really got panned. It was a little tone deaf, the wrong song. They really couldn't sing. It just sort of felt gratuitous. And there are other articles too. Um, there's a New York Times article that um, you can find about how people are not reacting well to celebrities kind of talking at their audience. Uh, it needs to be very authentic um, and make sure, you know, there, one celebrity showed their great big lawn, it looked like their very modern house, it looked like a scene from um, um, the movie Parasite. Um, so be really careful how you use them. They, they want to be there to, what you want them to do is to play a role of helping people, to, helping people find ways to be, um, finding ways to be um, helpful during this, during this epidemic. So it's uh, avoid having celebrities be directive to, um, to your audience. And then, you know, find new avenues for your CEOs and EDs. A, a lot of them aren't traveling as much. So bring them out more. Again, have them moderating panels, have them send out emails, have them be more visible than they might um, be otherwise. Finally, we're gonna get, we're just gonna just one little thing. The the little things matter. Uh, they matter a lot, actually. Um, and let's just go here. This is you know we're, we just went through a whole slew of different video platforms. But one of the most important things about using those video platforms is making sure you you look good and um, and that the video quality is as as sharp as possible. So just some very simple tips. Make sure that the light source is um, facing you. It should be behind the camera. You know, never have a window behind you. That's what's called backlit. And never have, avoid having them on the side as well. As you saw my colleagues, all of them lowered their, all lowered their blinds so that you don't get this bright spot behind you. The background should complement you, but shouldn't be distracting. You know, you don't want like a big empty, you don't want to see the back of somebody's house, a kitchen and kids running around and dogs running around. Try to have like some bookshelves. You can even move a little bit on an angle too to make it more interesting, to make it more interesting but just make sure it's not distracting. That's what's important. Um, and then also make sure the camera is at least at your eye level or higher. Very important. You shouldn't, shouldn't look like you're looking down into a, into a ditch. You want it to make sure that it's the camera's above you or at your eye level, ideally a little bit above you. Um, so let's move on to um, Q and A. So the whole team, we have the whole team here, and we're going to answer your questions. So just waiting for the queue, and we'll get um, 
some questions. Okay, how would medium, how would a medium um, posting differ from posting a blog or op-ed on your organization's pre-existing website? That's an awesome question. Really smart question. That's really about your audience, and it's about your website, how your website is used. You know, a lot of us, um, you know, a lot of our websites are can be a little marketing-ish. You know, uh, uh, and it's okay. I think websites are good for blogs. It depends upon, um, you know, if you already have an audience there. What Medium is good for is a way of separating it a little bit, so it doesn't seem like it's completely connected to your organization. So it. You're, it, it's true. It's not the same. Uh, it doesn't have the same credibility as the New York Times, where you've been selected to appear. Um, but here, um, people know Medium, and they know it's a little different. It's it's not. It doesn't feel like it's under the brand of an institution. It's under the brand of a um, uh, a platform for everybody to have a voice. So keep. To, I, I wouldn't. It's not either or. If you, I would use blogs for. Um, for your website, but if you have an op-ed, something important to say, use Medium. A lot of celebrities and CEOs use Medium to make important announcements, um, and it's very effective. So, really good question. I think another thing to add on the Medium is the opportunity for organic discovery. Mm -hmm. um, just like other digital content, you can tag it with yeah. politics or liberal or progressive or water or environment, whatever that is. And someone that's reading a feed that's curated with content of that nature there's a likelihood that your that your content will get into their feed as well. So you can reach new audiences that you aren't um, usually interacting with. It's also more likely that people will share it because it's easier to share than your website. So it's very easy to share on LinkedIn or Facebook um, and uh, or Twitter. Um, and in that way, you can reach a whole lot more people than you would doing it through your website. And as always, the choice is yours. But like I said about Facebook and Instagram, almost every single digital platform, tactic, et cetera, is always going to depend on your goals, who you want to see your stuff, who you want to who you want to 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 rouse to 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 call them call to action. Um, and if Medium is going to do that for you, then absolutely do it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um Charlie, I wonder if you want to take this one. Are there other other self-published anybody? Are there any other self-publishing platforms aside from Medium that we recommend? Actually, anybody can take this. I personally think Medium is the one you want to use. Yeah. I'm gonna, uh, Lauren, Lauren, you were just actually saying. I think you know you can use Insta, you can use Facebook, you can use not Instagram really, but you can use Facebook to to publish. You you can use Facebook to publish. It would come up as a Facebook post. Um, but if you wanted a standalone blog that is not necessarily uh, connected to your actual company or organizational website, um, one thing uh, that I was I was on the digital team at YWCA a long time ago, and they had a blog that was separate. It was a WordPress blog, so you can use WordPress. It it, it allowed them to dive deeper into topics that they worked on, um, so people would. You know, folks from from the from the uh, the policy team, or sometimes I would write one, uh, would step in and kind of be the guest blogger about things like domestic violence and uh, equal pay and other things like that. Um, and so uh, that's another opportunity there. Now, it's it's a little different from Medium in that Medium has lots of different verticals and whatnot. It's it really is more like a almost like a newsletter or, or newspaper or an online magazine, whereas a WordPress would just be coming from you. And it would be a little bit harder for people to kind of stumble upon it the way they would with Medium. I think another great outlet for long form content um, using those platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, we see it a lot with celebrities commonly posting apologies. Um, but if you actually do, like you write something in your notes on your iPhone, and then you can actually post that as an Instagram post, or you can post it on Twitter. Um, again, reaching the audiences that are where your people are most commonly hearing from you, um, but you're not subject to that 100 or 240 character limit, um, yeah. or in whatever your Instagram stories. Um, like la the last week, or sorry, the um, weekend update host Che um, from Saturday Night Live just this week, he posted a like eight slide yeah. story on his Instagram talking about his experience of losing his grandmother to the virus. Um, long form content, lots of very personal thoughts um, that he was able to reach through that through that platform, by, but also still sort of self publishing. Um, so don't underestimate whatever 
mm-hmm. using using pictures of your work to put on these other channels to uh, promote it and reach those audiences. I would be yeah. careful with that only, if, I mean, I think it's a great idea, but I would be careful to, you, your message has to be as tight as possible and make sure that it is that is that it is relevant and that it is timely and that it should be, be said by you right now. Because I will tell you when a celebrity has used their, their, their notes, uh, their notes section and done a screenshot in that way, and it was, and it was, did not go very well and it was not well received, the internet is forever. So make sure that you are on message, make sure that it is relevant, timely, that it is kind and all of that. Yeah, just to, just a final note on this question. I think all you guys said this, a lot of it is where your followers are. Mm-hmm. Like Michael Che did that because he has a lot of Instagram followers. Mm-hmm. A lot of celebrities, you know, really use Instagram heavily. But I think all, all those points, um, and Lauren, you're totally right. Be really careful because it is forever. Let's go on to the next question. What kind of content, what kind of content are you considering or recommending for those pithy emails? Just an outreach that says, we're in this together, I'm thinking of you, or something more policy news? A, a really good question. I'll, I'll I'll start and I'll let others jump in here. But I think um, uh, I, I think it has, I think it's authentic to you. I don't think I could, I could, any of us could dictate this to you, but I think it's what's in your, what's in your heart and what's going on in your organization. So yeah, we're in this together and I'm, and we're thinking of you, I, you know, but I think I would go a little deeper. Um, you know, the, the we're in this together and I'm thinking of you piece can be come off as a little platitudinal. So I think we want to hit, mm-hmm. you know, talk about what's going on, be very real, talk mm-hmm. about where people are, talk about people who've been touched by the virus in your organization mm-hmm. and talk about, yeah, talk about policy news, but try to connect it. Try not to, you know, you don't want to be tone deaf like there's nothing. Like what's going on outside isn't going on outside. You want to connect it as closely as possible. Anybody else want to jump yeah, in on that? With email strategy, it's really, really important to think about two things. Um, what do you want people to feel? And what do you want people to do? Um, these are our very unique times in that, you know, the call to action you would have done two months ago, three months ago, may not be the one you would do now. So maybe now is not the time to hit people up for money. Maybe it is, it depends on what you're asking them for money for to do. Um, Maybe it's a, maybe it is, you know, sending, sending a, you know, notes of support to essential workers in hospitals or something like that. So think about what, if if it's really a matter of what you want them to do, um, choose that call to action wisely. You do not always have to have one, but for most emails, you know, depending on what what you're trying to do with email, um, it, it, it helps to have those two things in mind. When they read it, what do you want them to do? How do you want them to feel? Now is also a really good time to reach out to your members and your supporters and say, you know, we're in this together. Here's here's what our plan had been. Here's how we're changing it so that people understand how you're turning, for example, to virtual advocacy versus door knocking, um, or how you're turning your gala into something virtual so that they they know where you were and you're taking them to where you're going now. Anyone else? If not, okay. How do you recommend promoting Reddit AMAs, especially to those who are not active on Reddit? Good question. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to take that one. Um, so I think Reddit is, like I said, a very unique community of very passionate users. Um, but the Reddit community extends from both the users to uh, what they like to call lurkers. Um, so anyone can go to Reddit. You don't need to have an account in order to go view content. Um, you can be a uh, an active bystander and just sort of read read the feed that's are that's already happening. Um, but you want to promote it just like any other event. Um, post about it on your Twitter account, post about it on your Facebook account, um, put it in an email, have the link ready to go for folks um, so that people know to go log in. Um, and if folks want to be able to participate during it, creating an account is uh, as quick and easy as putting in your username and hitting uh, hitting create. Reddit's all about privacy. Um, you can have as little information as you want out in the world. Um, but like I said earlier, you wanna plan all your events, digital or not, um, just as you would for an in-person event. So get people to register, get people to sign up, be sure to send the reminder email the day of um, and make it as easy for your members to go access that as you can. Um, You can also advertise on Reddit. 
Um, so if you are having act, if you have an active uh, account already, posting in the threads where you want to be promoting it, folks will hear about it. Um, if you contact the AMA, uh, the Ask Me Anything thread moderators, um, they will also put it on the public schedule, so folks can actually look at the schedule and see what's coming up. Um, there's lots of help available out there um, in the Reddit community to make sure that your content is seen and that folks engage on it well. People want to add questions. We have we have some time to take some more. Um, I noticed somebody in the uh, live comments posted their medium feed. Exactly what you need to do. That's how you get it out there. So thank you for that. Any more questions? And just for the folks that are um, asking, I saw a couple. Is this going to be available later? Yes, it will be available on the Raven Group uh, YouTube page. Um, in perpetuity. So if uh, you want to watch it later, share it with other folks as a useful resource, please uh, share that YouTube link, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, we'll be doing lots of events um, through the Raving Group as policy breakfasts, as power lunches, um, as these sort of panel discussions to help folks out, but also to get them connected to, uh, to influential folks and other advocacy partners. Um, so subscribe there and be able to tune into all of our other events um, where you can take, take part live or you can watch them afterwards as well. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you everybody for joining. We really appreciate it. If you have um, any other questions, we're just contact us. There's our website at the bottom. We have emails um, and you can contact any of us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If there's any other final comments from the group, we'll, uh, we'll close out this session. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, all. Thanks everyone.